name is Anton, aka Tom Piper, and I'm here with Sir David Wedding. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> um, how was your trip up here today? Sweet as a nut, yeah, on the train. I used to drive up to all these gigs back in the day, and then I decided to start taking the train. And it's really nice, because you oh. get to see the countryside, and it was very chill. Yeah, with the train nowadays, well, two hours, 15 minutes. Exactly. Major city to major city, we cannot complain with that. And funnily enough, when I arrived, it was raining. Imagine that. Oh, no. Manchester, <laughs> raining. Never. Oh, you, you, you've just missed the heat wave that we had. Yeah, well, I, we got the tail end of that in London when I'd just come back from Europe, and um, it was lovely. First days of October, blazing sunshine. But it's nice to be back in Manchester. I used to come over here in the 70s. I, I was working in Sheffield, so oh, yeah. I come over here for equity actors union meetings. Okay, yeah, I've heard you've got uh, a special, um, special place in the heart there for Sheffield. I do, yeah. And I, it was, I mean, the, the, the Yorkshire is different um, mm. um, to, to the south. I mean, people are, I, I found when I first came up here, much friendlier. Yeah, I remember first going into a shop in uh, in Stoke. Oh, hi, ducks! You know that, that whole it, it's it's a different world up here. No, 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 son, boy. What was the um, first record that you bought? One of the first records that I bought was um, Telstar by the Tornadoes. Okay, uh, which was a massive number one hit. Um, and one of the first West Indian records I bought was obviously My Boy Lollipop, yeah. Guns of Navarone, Scatterlights. Um, if there was a dub plate that you don't have, because I know you've got many, yeah. if there was anybody past and present that you would like to get a dub plate off, who would that be? Well, that's a very interesting question. It's also quite a difficult one. Um, Can you give me two answers? I I've got dubs from people that I never thought I would get dubs from. For example, Prince Buster, who's never voiced dubs for anyone, and he voiced two for me, and he refused to voice again for anybody else. I felt, as you can imagine, deeply honored by that, apart from the fact that I'm a Prince Buster fanatic. Also, Phyllis Dillon, who'd never voiced and did voice for me. So those were people that I thought I would never get dubs from, and I did. Um, that's a difficult question, because um, I did, I have, I uh, managed to get dubs from most of the people whose work I greatly admired. It was very difficult to get Dennis Brown initially because Dennis's touring schedule was nutsoid. Mm. But I remember, never forget, the, getting the phone call from Gussie Clark. He said, someone wants to speak to you. It was in uh, 25 years, years ago. And um, it was Dennis Brown. He said, I've just voiced To The Foundation for you. You've got three different mixes. I was like, <laughs> To The Foundation, Dennis Brown on dub. <laughs> three different mixes. Three different mixes, not just yeah, one. Yeah. That though um, that would be my answer to that question because you can never have everything. Um, and if I mean I would have loved to have had more dubs with Garnet Silk, certainly. Um, you know. well, absolute legend. He, um, he passed away when I was um, my mum first took us back to Jamaica. Around that time, around Christmas time, as before, I think. This is the 12th of December, 1994. 19... 94, I think. 94, 94. I, think. I remember that was um, for me uh, growing up. Like we had, a, we had a cassette. My uncle was sending us over tapes and stuff at the time, and we had um, a couple of tapes of like Garnet Silk that we were playing. We were absolutely blazing it before we got out there. And just to hear that kind of information, hear that news when we got out there was. Oh. His was a tragic that. loss. I was a big, big fan, and he was very, very spiritual. And he had this remarkable voice and this quality as a songwriter, um, quality of uh, 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 quality both as a songwriter and as a singer. And he, his voice was haunting. I think "Hello, Mama Africa" will always be for me. Um, I mean, I remember getting. Uh, letters from Africa when when because cassette and tape was very much the, the, the main form of communication um, in the 80s obviously and um, and even in the early 90s and cassette and tape carried the swing yeah. and it was as a result of cassette and tapes being sent all over the world that people got to hear about our music yeah. 
And I remember getting letters from South Africa um, uh, from listeners who'd got cassettes, they'd send them to Capital Radio in London saying, you know, um, uh, how much they'd enjoyed that song in particular because of, of what it stood for. I think I'll be playing that when I get home actually. Hello, Mama <laughs> that, that's Africa. one of my favourite. Yeah. Gad Excel is one of my favourite all time artists. <laughs> Now, obviously in the UK we've had the problems with the riots and stuff mm. recently. Mm. Um, your message is a, a lot about peace and love. So if you had a track or a couple of tracks that educated the youth of today, what track would you play to get the message across? You'd have to immediately reach for songs like One Love, as obvious as it may seem, because of what it preaches. Yeah. Um, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Whalers, um, I'm a big fan of what they stood for um, and, and the songs that they made. That would be Rat Race by Bob Marley is, is another powerful song because it describes the world in which we live. Um, individual songs, um, uh, uh, one of my all time favourite songs as everyone knows is Declaration of Rights by the Abyssinians because it speaks volumes. Um, in terms of what what has happened, what happened from Africa to 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 the West Indies across that 400-year period, and what it caused, the infighting and so on. Um, music is a powerful weapon, and it does and have and can have an effect on people's lives. Um, uh, those would be songs that I would immediately think of. There'll no doubt be others that will rush to my mind. Um, afterwards, but Unchained by Bob Andy, uh, Declaration of Rights by the Abyssinians, Unchained by Bob Andy, also Peace of Mind by Bob Andy. Um, that, if actually, if, if anything, that would be a song that I, I really would have drawn for. I've used that song and Feeling Soul. I'm, I'm a big, big fan of Bob Andy. His, his songwriting is, is absolutely unique and Peace of mind and feeling soul. If ever you wanted a code of living, if you should listen to Feeling Soul by Bob Andy, to be true to one another, to be kind and gentle to each other, to give your best when it's asked of you, to do what you have to do when you're supposed to do. You've got to feel it in your soul. And that song touched me the very first time I heard it in the late 60s. I was blown away by it. And equally, Peace of Mind um, is another song in terms of the world we're living in now and the difficulties we face. Those songs give, give me um, and my soul great encouragement. Um, that's what music does, that's the positive aspect of music and that's why the negative aspects of, of the glorification of violence and, and thuggery and, and etc. Cetera, et cetera, um, have always saddened me because um, they, obviously the songs, certain songs can be a reflection of what's happening within society naturally but those songs that endorse it and glorify it, um, that's, not what in, that's not what inspired me. That's not what brought my love of this music uh, to the foreground when I first heard it. I defy anyone to listen to Sata Masagana and not be completely blown away by the Abyssinians or to listen to Black Heart Man, which describes what happened to Rastafarians in Jamaican society in the early 60s when Bunny Whaler made that song. There are so many songs that speak out in terms of, 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 of what Rasta and because without Rasta we wouldn't have the music we have today. You can take all the, the dance or vibes and, and all those elements, but without the Rastafarians in Warwick Hill, without Count Ozzy and the Mystic Revelation of Rastafari, we simply wouldn't have the great um, uh, legacy of music that we have. And that's why this music is so strong. That's why when people discover this music, young people discover this music, even if it's you can get it if you really want by Jimmy Cliff, which is you know a massive hit, or Israelites by Desmond Decker. It's the significance of those songs, 007 Shantytown. Uh, there, I mean, there are countless songs, but when people first hear them, they they strike a chord. They struck a chord with me when I was 16, and I realised this stuff was different. This wasn't pop. Well, well ahead of the time. This was deep, powerful music. And that's why, when you stick a pin and think, hang on, I can go, any of us can go to any country in the world, from you know, any country, and the name Bob Marley 
is, 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 uh, is, is known, um, reggae is known, and the power of this music, the fact that from, from Tokyo to, to Germany, you know, 30,000 reggae fans at Summer Jam in, in Germany, you know, is it 230,000 reggae fans in Benicassim in near Barcelona for, for the Rotterdam Sunsplash this year. Um, that speaks volumes to the power of this music. And I'm here in Manchester tonight, and the first time I did the Warehouse Project gig, I was quite nervous because I thought, um, oh, you know, I, I, was, I was playing to an audience that perhaps I wouldn't normally play to. Mm. But I decided that I would do what I've always done, which is play the music that's important to me. And you can take a song like Israelites by Desmond Decker, which was the first ever British number one for a Jamaican artist, and play it at the Warehouse Project in Manchester and get the biggest forward of the night because <laughs> it just is a magnificent song and yet no one in that house that night in that car park, underground park, was born when that record was made and yet the tidal wave of a forward describes the significance of this music and that's why this music is so powerful and so influential. Sweet reggae music, what we love. i got one more question for you. Um, as a man who's travelled all over the world, um, granted, you do that. You have a, you've got a family. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And um, how did the family react to it? And are there any up and coming DJs in the family that we have to look out for in the future? Um, you'd have to ask my sons that question. I, I can't speak for them. Um, I do know that they have a passion for music. Um, I've not encouraged them to pursue DJing as as a vocation. I think that's something that you have to do, or you do because you want to do it. What I have encouraged them to do, and what I will encourage every person listening to this broadcast right now, is to seek education and continue to stay in education for as long as you can, because it is through that that, you, that so much is revealed to you. And I will now get off my soapbox. I think education is paramount to everyone, and everyone deserves it, and they should seek it and hold it and not let go until, they, and, and, until they've absolutely devoured it. Uh, because you can never stop learning. So to me, um, it is it is so important to do that and pursue that. Um, yes, my my family of obviously my uh, we my wife and I have been together for you know over thirty years. Um, and uh, yes, DJing is it, it goes with the territory that there was going to be times when I'm travelling and, and and but she when she met me that's how it was. And um, my sons have a love of music and they have a love of many other things. If they choose to pursue that professionally, that's their call. But um, we all know how difficult it is to be in this uh, business called, yeah. um, you know, music production. It can be very, um, it can, it can it's be very tough. Yeah, demanding. Yeah, very demanding. So that's their call. Radigan no in on a fuss and fight. The plate is what is killing you tonight. As you know, there's been an explosion in the UK underground um, with the dubstep music, the dubstep scene. Dub reggae is responsible for this, and I, I personally I think that dubstep's been around for a lot longer than people actually give it recognition for. How do you think it's changed the UK scene, and how do you how do you expect it to grow? Um, well, I'm not qualified to speak on it on it in that sense because I don't know enough about it. But what I do know is that um, that dubstep world has embraced me, and I'm very grateful to the dubstep world for doing that. I was made aware of dubstep many years ago by my eldest son who said, who drew my attention to it and I could see and feel and hear the connection between Jamaican drum and bass, dub music and dubstep, clearly it's there. Um, the one thing that I found exciting about elements of, dub, of dubstep that I've heard, some of it's pretty hard and some of it's more accessible. Some of it is in the way that jungle was using elements of reggae and, and, and samples and yeah, so on yeah, yeah. And, and enhancing it. Um, but it, it's, what I like about it is its energy and I think uh, if you've not seen dubstep being played in a live venue then you've not experienced the dubstep experience. Um, I've heard it for initially played in, in, in my library, in my studio, um, on small speakers, but going to a gig and hearing it being played by DJs and watching the response from the crowd is altogether another experience which is typical of course of, of, of what live music is, although it's it's recorded but it's live in the sense that the DJs are playing it yeah. and it's invigorating and it's very very exciting and of course what it's enabled um, these young producers to create is their own music and that's what I like about it the fact that they they you know we can use examples of you know Breakage who's playing tonight here 
um, Casper and so on, who've taken the legacy uh, of, of creating music yourself and being an individual and, and powering up to that. That's very exciting and, and there are elements of it which I, can, I totally identify with because when dub music first hit me in 72, 73, I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe it. It was just like, wow, this is so exciting. You can't imagine what it was like to first hear those drum and bass records from Jamaica because they were drum and bass. Drum and bass Jamaican, yeah. but it was, that's what it was called, bass and drum, drum and bass, dub. And the fact that they would break down rhythms and echo them and splatter them and, you know, King Tubby, Lee Perry, um, Errol, Errol, Errol Thompson, the great engineers were experimenting with this music. And you can hear that in dubstep now. And, you know, for my voice to be sampled in some of these recordings, you know, I consider it to be an honor. And as a result of that, I've been invited into this world that perhaps I wouldn't have been a part of in the same way. I'd have probably been an outsider on the outside looking in, and I've been invited in. I mean, I'm making an appearance tonight here in Manchester with dubstep DJs, not with reggae DJs. Normally, it would be the, the complete reverse. I would be with other reggae DJs playing only reggae music in an environment where only reggae yeah, music was playing. being played. So for me, it's, it's a refreshing world to have been invited into, and, and, I'm, and I'm most grateful for the experience. Um, I've noticed you've got, um, you've got a dub play, actually, I think of Breakage or d -double. Yeah, um, I think that was a massive track. Do you have any plans to have any more the plays? Yeah, on any of your MCs? And stuff? Uh, as and when it feels appropriate. Yeah, um, that obviously was was a, a particularly important record, yeah. um, and it was natural that I would pursue a dub because th the reason I pursued the dub was was there was a big sound clash against Bass Odyssey, and uh, it was two thousand and eight, yeah. I think, and uh, that, that, kind of, that track's already three years old, isn't it? I mean, imagine yeah. that. Um, and so yes, uh, was it two thousand eight or two thousand and nine? Maybe it was two thousand and eight. Um, that I first cut that dub, and um, yeah, it was, it was <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. yeah, that was a big one. That was that was a nice secret weapon to have. Yeah, <laughs> certainly surprised Bass Odyssey and the Jamaican <laughs> element who were like, "What is this? It's called dubstep." <laughs> right. Okay. Um, what does the future hold for you? Gosh, um, I I really have no idea. As long as I can still enjoy what I'm doing, and I do consider myself to be privileged. To be able to do something that I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, as somebody once said, if you do what you really enjoy, you'll never work again. Uh, if you can in any way embrace the things you love and, and, and earn a living from it, then you're fortunate. Um, I love sharing my love of music with like-minded souls. For me, that's a privilege and I've enjoyed doing it for the best part of you know, 35 years professionally. And if the phone keeps ringing and people will still want to turn up and hear me play my records, or my dub plates or my CDs, then I'll carry on doing so until somebody tells me to get off. <laughs> well, obviously tonight when we go to the Warehouse Project, some of the freshers that are going to be in town, they must have been born in the mid-90s, I do believe so. Yeah, I mean, somebody <laughs> said to me the other, the other day, can you play some old school? I said, yeah, I just played some old school. And they said, no, old school. Now, I was playing rock steady records, <laughs> you know, 67, 68. And they said, no, 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 old school. I said, well, what do you mean? Slang tang. I said, Slang Tang's not old school. Yes, it is. I wasn't even born when it came out. And I realised, Slang Tang came out in 85, 95, 2000. That's over 20, you know, that's a long time ago. And some of these, many of our of, of dance fans now were not born in 1985. So to them, it's like, no, slow version. Um, is nutsoid, it's crazy. And that was the introduction of, of electronic music, really, to a degree in Jamaica when that first came out. I remember, I actually remember the first time I ever played that was at the Strand, was at the Strand on a Sunday afternoon. And um, we, we got it from, sent from a dub plate. In those days, dub plates were delivered so someone had come on a plane, so Jammies had gone to the airport and given somebody, said, can you carry this to Rodigan in London? And they brought it to the radio station, Capital Radio, on the Saturday night. And on the Sunday afternoon, um, I played it at this all day at the Strand um, in London's West End. And from I played it, I'll never forget the forward, it was like a tidal wave. It was amazing. Um, that's just one example of, of, um, of revival music, the, the fact that don, 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 something like as crazy as that and for an audience and we're going to see that tonight as you say freshers in the house who and that's the great thing about playing to a young vibrant audience they do have this open attitude and music is music and if it strikes a chord with them yeah. then you know bang wham you're off you're, you're rolling you're ruining me and that is a message to say that music or good music has no age limit 
it always evolves, it will always live on. I'm Tom Piper, David Runnigan, thank you very much, it's been a pleasure. Electronique, we're out. Thank you. Murderer, Radigana murderer, oh Lord. Murderer, Radigana sound killer, oh Lord. And if you crash it, Radigana, you crash it, murderer. And when they play a party pipe, that's a murderer.